Hey there everybody, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel and as I mentioned in the comments on my last character class video, there will be a follow up on uh, the video on Warlocks and this is it. This video may really well end up being much more comprehensive than the first one because I'm going to talk about a lot of conceptual and story based elements and options for the class. Those of you who play the game already have access to the basic information I provided already, so this video will more likely be far more useful to you. My mission is to inspire as well as inform, after all. So, first, an apology for missing out on the Sword Coast Adventure Guide additions to the class, the information specific to the Forgotten Realms and the Undying Patron, so some information on these options uh, for the class are coming. Also, I will just have a general chat about the amazing potential of this character class and how it really fires up my imagination. I know a lot of you love it when I pour out ideas, so this video is very much for you. So, the Undying Patron, let me just read out the introduction to this patron type directly from the source. Death holds no sway over your patron, who has unlocked the secrets of everlasting life, although such a prize like all power comes at a price. Once mortal, the Undying has seen mortal lifetimes pass like the seasons, like the flicker of endless days and nights. It has the secrets of the ages to share, secrets of life and death. Beings of the sort include Vecna, Lord of the Hand and the Eye, the Dread Luz, uh, or Ayuz, the Lich Queen Vol, the Undying Court of Erinal, Vlakich, Lich Queen of the Githyanki, and the Deathless Wizard Fistandantilus. In the realms, Undying Patrons include Lalok, the Shadow King, Legendary Master of Warlock's Crypt, and Gilgim, the God King of Untha. The following spells are in addition to the standard Warlock spell list for those with an Undying Patron. You get False Life and Ray of Sickness at first level, Blindness, Deafness and Silence for second level, Feign Death and Speak with Dead at third level, Aura of Life and Death Ward at fourth level, and Contagion and Legend Lore at fifth level. Starting at first level, the Warlock learns the Spare the Dying Cantrip. They also have advantage on saving throws against any disease. Additionally, Undead have difficulty harming these Warlocks. If an undead targets them directly with an attack or a harmful spell, that creature must make a wisdom saving throw against the warlock spell save DC. On a failed save, the creature must choose a new target or forfeit targeting someone uh, forfeit targeting someone instead of you, potentially wasting the attack or spell. On a successful save, the creature is immune to the effect for 24 hours. Also, this only counts for attacks that target the warlock specifically, not area effect spells. An undead is also immune to this effect for 24 hours if the warlock targets it with an attack or a harmful spell. That makes sense. So they just sort of automatically feel like the warlock is an ally of some kind, in so much as any living thing that can be. Starting at 6th level, the warlock gains an extra vitality when they cheat death or when they help someone else cheat it. The Warlock can regain hit points equal to 1d8 plus their constitution modifier when they succeed on a death saving throw or when the Warlock stabilizes a creature with Spare the Dying. They can only benefit from this feature uh, once per long rest. Beginning at 10th level, the Warlock can hold their breath indefinitely and they don't require food, water or sleep, though they do still benefit from a short or long resting uh, period to reduce exhaustion and recover spells and such. In addition, they now only age one year for every 10 years that pass and are immune to being artificially or magically aged. So by 10th level, they're starting to get pretty weird compared to ordinary people. When they reach 14th level, they attain supernatural resilience. Once per short or long rest, they can use a bonus action to regain hit points equal to 1d8 plus their warlock level, and this restoration is actually able to put themselves back together. If the Warlock puts a severed body part back in place when they use this feature, the part reattaches, it just stitches closed. Obviously this is a fantastic option for someone who wants to play a necromancer. It's also an excellent cross-class option for a high-level wizard who is making the transition into becoming a lich. With a slight modification, it's also an excellent template for those doing a Kara tour campaign, which would feature the celestial court and the secrets of internal alchemy and the various pathways to immortality. It's, um, so it's not entirely focused on the undead. It seems like it at first, but you can play it quite differently. 
Also, on a side note, in a high-level campaign where some story culminates in a character attaining a great transition, so say a high-level monk on a quest for alchemical immortality defeats a major villain, completes an arduous quest, attains the secret formula, and manages to perform the complex process of brewing a potential uh, immortality brew, it is okay to tra instantly transition them into an undying cross class, just transferring all the specific, uh, the special class features without the need for a pact or any spell knowledge. You just give them the special traits I listed a moment ago. That's perfectly fine in your home game. Um, that, that, that would make sense. On the topic of traveling to the far reaches of Toril, uh, beyond the contain, uh, continent of Faerun, those of you who have watched my video on the ecology, the ecology of gods will remember that gods in the pantheons of the world of Toril have specific territory they claim on that world. Uh, the reason for this is mostly because back when the gods first appeared they started to fight with the primordials. They were grossly outnumbered and had to summon gods from other realms. Other pantheons had arrived subsequent. Um, from the subsequent to the time of the Dawn War, including the arrival of the Mulharandi pantheon from ancient Earth, the uh, Egyptian pantheon. To cut a long story short, that pantheon is now little more than myth, relics, and legends, but the idea of uh, God forming a personal bond with a mortal who is outside that God's territory is a very interesting one. They can't convey the powers of a cleric, but they can act more like a warlock's patron sort of bending the rules. Now how is this for a way to handle divine territories in the Forgotten Realms? When a cleric leaves their god's territory and enters another zone, they lose the cast, class features and spells of a cleric and instead become a level equivalent celestial warlock, with that god being their patron. <laughs> Intriguing, eh? Celestial patrons raised a few questions in the comments section on the last video, so I'll talk a bit more about that type of warlock later. The Forgotten Realms has a great list of patrons for warlock, warlocks, again, uh, referencing the Sword Coast Adventures Guide directly, with some additional thoughts of my own. The Archfey has a lot of players pretty fired up, but the lore on just who and what the Fey Lords and Ladies of the Summer and Winter Courts are, as well as the ancient society they have, including rivalries and some outright wars, is a mystery to many, because it's so scattered and sparse in official setting guides, particularly for 5th edition. So... We know that one can enter the Fey world from portals that exist in places of wild and perfect beauty. You can pass through a Fey crossing by entering a clearing, passing through the surface of a pool, stepping into a circle of mushrooms, or crawling under the bark trunk of a tree. Great, well, that's a slim picking of possibilities. It ignores the fact that a lot of evil powers come from the Fey world, such as the Hags, the Fomorians, Displacer Beast, the Unseelie Court, um, which is a loose hierarchy of evil Fey. They lair in mires, decayed and dank forests, deep um, and vermin-infested ruins, caverns, places infused with ancient and wicked magic. This is the land where elves originated. They are the masters of powerful and lasting magical rituals, enchantments, called mythals. The Feywild is brimming with mythals and supernatural power. It has so much primal power that plants just spontaneously wake up and start talking. The crossings into the Feywild can take the form of a dream that you wake from, not in your bed, but in the Feywild. It can be a song sung by an Aladrin bard. You can be in a foul swamp, uh, ancient standing stones under a full moon, the pooled blood of a unicorn. Warlocks who seek out such places to bargain with the Archfey or of that realm for power are entranced and lured to the Fey. But a great many have no idea what they're dealing with until suddenly they are accepting the pact, or they were always fated to turn out this way due to some magic, or a curse, or crossbreeding in their ancient family history long ago. Uh, noteworthy Archfey patrons include the following. Titania, the Summer Queen, is perhaps the mightiest of the Archfey. With a smile she can ripen a crop and with a frown summon wildfires. She rules the Seely of the Summer Courts, so the Seely are the good Fey. Oberon, the Green Lord, an unrivaled hunter and woodland warrior, is Titania's lover and frequently her foe. Oberon is attuned to every bough of every tree and every branch of, um, of every stream in the forest of the Feywilds. If Oberon has a weakness, it's his wild nature. Um, it's his heart to be free. His mood swings are like the weather vane in a windstorm. So he's tempestuous. He goes where he pleases. He does what he wants. Hirschlam, the Prince of Fools, is thought to be the first satyr. He can sing the shine off gold and his jokes and antics can cause stones to cry with laughter. Yet Hirsch, Hirschim is, oh, Hirschim, is also the soul of savagery and the wild. Hirschim is a fool and he's a prankster and prone to mischief. When such jokes turn vicious and deadly, 
the savage part of him is at play. The Queen of Air and Darkness, that's her name, rules the unsealy of the gloaming court from an onyx throne uh, that sits empty except for a hovering night diamond, a black gem the size of a human head that dully glimmers with captured stars. The Queen of Air and Darkness is an invisible presence around it, her voice thundering from the night diamond or whispering secrets seriously into the ears of her courtiers and sometimes both at once. And of course, whispering secrets and promises to any warlocks who happen to be dreaming dark thoughts as they look up into the night sky a little bit too close to a dark portal to the unsealy. The Prince of Frost was once known as the Sun Prince, but his heart grew cold when his betrothed betrayed him and he es- and uh, escaped, her soul becoming one of the stars. Ever since, the rightful prince has sought to reunite with his betrothed whenever she is reincarnated in raw, uh, mortal form, kind of similar to the plotline of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Some folks have asked me to elaborate on the ancient creator race of the Feywild. They are called the Lachey. They appear much like elves or Eladrin, but are very pale, like albinos, uh, albinos, except their eyes are black orbs and they are tall and thin with slightly less pointed ears than an elf. Lachey are immortal. They only die if they're killed. They also have an extraordinary um, magical power. In fact, if you took uh, look closely at the Lords and Ladies of the Fey Courts, the majority of them are, or were, Lachey. High Lady Aldalf uh, of the city of Carador in the kingdom of Sarafel in the Moonshay Isles was a Lachey. Her rule lasted 11,000 years. So obviously this race has had and continues to have a huge influence on both the Feywild and the mortal worlds. A typical Lachey is a stickler for proper behaviour, respect and etiquette. They are gifted in language and will learn a new one within minutes of having heard it. They can also pick up sign language with equal ease. Lachey uh, can charm other beings simply by looking at them, and mastered a strange ability to form weapons out of nothing but the power of thought alone. These Lachey weapons were formed from the essence of each individual Lachey as if they were extensions of their own body. Kind of like lightsabers. Lachey can also change form, teleport, turn invisible, breathe underwater. Um, with their magics, among other uh, long list of other things, they're just pretty uber. Lachey have forgotten more spells and rituals than your average human archmage will ever learn. And it was they who created the many powerful mythic portals and crossings into the mortal world from the Feywild, modifying and creating new Fey-blooded creatures to inhabit the mortal world. And Lachey are certainly powerful enough to serve as mysterious, elusives, and extremely knowledgeable patrons to Fey warlocks. Hags are, or were, originally fey creatures. They are spirits of malignant hatred that manifest in the twisted form of an old crone. They do have the power to be a patron to a fey warlock, but they are really, really bad masters, and I do not recommend them as patrons at all. Lost gods, vestiges, and the lingering avatars or aspects of gods and primordials long since dead and gone are also excellent patrons for warlocks. Obviously, these echoes of great power have a very strong desire to be restored to their former glory, and they will use whatever power they have left in order to uplift and empower the agents who will stand um, any chance of making it happen. So the goals of a warlock dedicated to this vestige can be modelled from the celestial patron, uh, the Hexblade or the Great Old One um, models. The patron can inform the warlock from time to time that there are uh, many special components, parts and versions of rituals loaded, uh, located here and there, letting the warlock follow their fate, but compelling them to find some lost trinket whenever they have a chance. They're pretty desperate and also a little bit lonely, I would imagine, um, just savouring the attention of the warlock. Warlocks dedicated to the celestial court of Karatur work particularly well, either cross-classed as a monk or a ranger, or teamed up with one of them in a party. Speaking of Celestials, the very method of offering an alliance and sharing power may stem right back to how the first Celestials fell from grace and uh, and the acceptance of Mount Celestia. In the epic and total warfare against Miska the Wolf Spider and the Queen of Chaos, packs and bonds were formed just to keep the angelic host fighting fit and on a par with the worst the demon lords had to offer. The angels were corrupted thanks to a, in small part to the natural mayhem of the elemental chaos, and they adopted a mentality that all demons must be destroyed by any means necessary, even if that means becoming evil in order to do so, as long as law is supreme. Who cares what or who is destroyed in the conflict? What they were doing was saving all of creation. 
They realized that the power of mortal souls to alter reality, reality by force of will and belief was the stronger, strongest weapon they had to restore order and structure in the wake of demonic destruction. And they devised a method, well, the perfect method for acquiring a stream, a steady stream of mortal souls. And well, I have a video talking about the origin of the Nine Hells. No need to rehash it here. Those warrior angels became the first devils. That reminds me. There are a bunch of fallen angels in the Out of the Abyss Adventure supplement. They're on page 185. They make for excellent celestial patrons as they have been trapped in eternal petrification deep in the Underdark for thousands and thousands of years, driving them quite insane. They are Anaya, Bartro, Harajan, Lorabellius, Nemevon, Silnia, Timail, and Zarod. And they've all got their particular um, type of madness. Which brings us to our next batch of Forgotten Realms patrons, the fiends. Numerous fiends forge packs with mortal warlocks in the realms, so many that warlocks are almost synonymous with infernal power in Faerun. These fiends include the archdevils of the Nine Hells and their most powerful dukes, the demon lords of the abyss, and the ultraloths who rule over Yugoloth armies. Such deals need not be struck directly with the power in question, however... Often a weaker fiend serves as an intermediary, and the warlock need not know exactly whom he or she serves. Notable Fiendish patrons, peculiar to the Forgotten Realms, or they have dealings with the Forgotten Realms, include the following. Bazka is the pit fiend who was behind the most recent incursion of infernal forces from Dragonspear Castle. Its plans for the Sword Coast were thwarted along with those of allied red wizards, but its ambitions in the region remain. And of course, you've got a cabal of red wizards who uh, pay homage to that particular pit fiend. Balafoss is a demon that serves Demogorgon. It considers itself the greatest servitor of the Prince of Demons and thus is a rival for Demogorgon's power. <laughs> That's not going to work out well. Eltab was once bound beneath the city of Altabor in Thay, caged even by the layout of the city's streets and canals. They built this whole place to form a glyph of an imprisonment. The demon is now loose in the world and seeking revenge. Uratu, the Balor, was uh, plagued Drizdu Urden for more than a century, largely over possession of an artifact called the Kren Shinabon. Um, having lost the last battle and been banished from the world, he, the Balor now seeks indirect means of revenge against Drizd. Again, I don't fancy his chances. Fraz Urblu is the former devil who became a proxy demon lord when he was banished from the Nine Hells. He is a rival of Demogorgon, Orcus and Grast, and widely hated by all other demons and devils. He contended with Demogorgon over the rulership of the Empire of Narthel uh, around the time of the fall of Damara. Gargoth is a mysterious infernal power who seeks godhood while trapped in the world within a magical shield. Lorian is a Cambion who collects warlocks like one might collect butterflies. His favourite collection, the Troll 13, includes warlocks of blood descended from the 13 who first made a pact with Asmodeus. Um, yeah. Was that Troll or Troil? Troil 13? Somebody let me know in the comments down below. Melchizedek is a Solar. A Solar, an angel, who fell from grace when he was betrayed by Saladrin. Um, or Saldarin, sorry. Ever since then, Malkazid has delighted in every wrong he can do to elves, but he grants uh, gains the greatest pleasure when he manipulates the elves into harming each other. So where elves are in conflict with each other, look for the influence of a particularly demented solar. Wind and Isle. Uh, Wind and I is a bellow lord who first tempted the dark elves to summon demons in the ancient wars between the elf peoples and uh, the crown wars. It also um, turned them to the worship of Loth, and he continued to advise and tutor them for long after their descent into the Underdark, basically indoctrinating them into the idea that they don't need the surface of any world anymore, the Underdark is theirs to command. Faerun has history layered on top of history. The average Faerunian has no idea that they may be farming crops on top of an ancient battleground itself, on top of a long-forgotten city ruin, and under that, catacombs of a lost civilization 30,000 years old. To give you some comparison, Cro-Magnon humans were camping out in caves on Earth, painting pictures of the animals they hunted 36,000 years ago. Faerun had the first empires of the creator races by the, that same time period. But 
Older still are the great old ones, the primordials, the lords of madness. Beyond the plains known to great wizards and sages lies the far realm of the great old ones, beings outside time, space, and sanity. That realm is reachable by profane rituals, and the dreams of some of these drawn to those entities' power. Some of the blasphemous names associated with this place and its madness include the following. Dendar, the night serpent, eater of the world or actually Eater of the Sun. It's said to be the spawn of the first nightmare, devourer of foul visions and harbinger of the end of the world. Her warlocks frequently dream of Dendar's hiss and the dry rasp of her scales when they first realize their potential power. Guanadawa, that which lurks, Underdark God of Aberrations, also known as the Elder Eye, it is worshipped, if such a word can be used, by slimes, oozes, and similar creatures. Kazef, the Chaos Hound, is a black skeletal mastiff covered in swarming maggots. Its blood is a black acid. The gods imprisoned Kazef in an unbreakable leash forged by Gond and a glowing ward conjured by Mistra, for which the Chaos Hound bit off Tyr's hand in a clear ripoff of Nordic folktale. Uh, Moandur is a dark power of corruption and decay. Those touched by its influence first receive a dream, the seed of meander, which uh, wherein the following words are heard. Question not the words of meander, lest you be stricken by the eating from within. Go forth and possess beings of power and influence for me. Slay and let the rot cover all. Fear me and obey. And they do. Uh, Tyranthoraxis, also called the Possessing Spirit or and the Flaming One, or Flamed One, seeks to rule the world through the bodies of others. Similar to the Earth Mother, it uses magical pools as windows in which, uh, into which the world um, has been inf- infected by its influence. Zargon, the Returner, also called the Invincible Tyrant, is said to be an undying and unkillable evil. Some stories claim Zargon was the original master of the Nine Hells. Others claim him to be a powerful demon prince exiled from the Abyss. Perhaps neither of these stories are true, but it can surely be said that Zargon is a power that inspires madness and terror, and he always has. And there there are many more lurking in the dark and creepy parts of your mind. Actually, an illicit L brain makes an excellent great old one patron as well. Uh, They live for a very long time. They may actually be immortal, if not killed. Okay, next topic. I'd like to delve into, um, which is warlocks and familiars. I particularly like the familiar that can talk and passes on messages and orders from the warlock's patron. Just seems like a great way to handle communication with the patron. Um, Though the warlock could resist a mental conversation with the patron. Um, If any of you grognards remember Mork calling Orson, come in Orson, or the high commander from Third Rock of the Sun with the big giant head using the transmitter in Harry's head to make loud announcements. It's absolutely hilarious to have a player character or warlock that largely ignores their patron until suddenly the patron demands something. They freak out and scramble to get it done before the patron busts them for being total slackers. Warlocks who try to pull a fast one on their patron, such as sacrificing a large toad dressed in diapers instead of a human child, hoping the patron won't notice the difference, or warlocks who are forced to despoil a sacred site but feel terribly guilty and donate half their adventuring loot to charities and beggars any chance they get, just on the down low. Warlocks can be hilariously funny to roleplay. An NPC warlock that has a weak and physically eldritch blast, they barely keep active by gathering up spiders and earthworms and sacrificing them in little profane circles. Now that's just funny. Remember the Necromonicon from Ash and the uh, from the Evil Dead movie? He has to remember the correct words to stop the forces of evil. Can't remember the last word, so he just coughs and hopes for the best. Imagine an absent-minded warlock doing that when they attempt to cast a ritual spell. After all, charisma is the primary attribute for a warlock, not intelligence or wisdom. (laughs) It's perfectly viable to play a warlock who is a complete idiot. Can't do that with a wizard. Back to familiars, perhaps the mephit, imp, quasit or sprite is the smart one out of the pair. What if you've role-played the role of the imp and the warlock was the one that was like your familiar? Just... That way, the the other way around. Does that make sense? Did did that make sense? I think that's perfectly viable. Probably not everybody's cup of tea, but I think it would be hilarious. Familiars have special communication with their master. They can also share some of their special abilities with them, such as the spell resistant of the quasit. However, 
Does the Warlock share something with the Familiar? I imagine the primary benefit for the Familiar is increased hit points and the protection of their Master. I would like to know what kind of Familiar is specific to Celestial Warlocks. Is, is it some sort of little cherub? Um, is it some sort of Celestial Sprite? Or a Celestial Creature such as a Dove? Or something more exotic? Like a dove that has no head or tail, it's just wings and a puffy little feather body. Um, as mentioned, as a uh, reply to a comment, I came up with unique familiars when I can't find anything else suitable. For great old ones, my suggestion was this, and I quote, Take the stats of the Myconid Sprout, remove sun sickness, rename the form of its attack, but keep the numbers the same, and you can have one of the following. Roll 1d6 on a 1. You get a tentacular spectacular, a sentient tentacle creature that can merge with your character's body and has a limited ability to grow an eye or mouth anywhere on itself that you can speak through or see through with concentration. Number two, an ancient amorph, slightly more hardy than an ooze, but with many of the same traits. The amorph can form into simple fleshy shapes and squeeze into most places. Kind of gross. Uh, number three is an organism, a spirit entity that can only possess and animate the internal organs of a recently deceased animal. So you could have basically the innards of a creature slopping around, dragging the corpse of it behind it. Really gross. Number four, the brain slug, a torpid purple leech-like parasite that once implanted can take over a small creature completely, turning the creature effectively into your new familiar, at least until the brain is eaten, eaten out by this thing. So kind of like a lesser version of an illithid worm parasite larval thing number five the stomach baby this is i particularly like this one a homunculus like creature that is created inside the warlock's stomach after they eat a bunch of living things they are recombined and then vomited out shuffling about as a tiny familiar for a while until they break down number six other me the familiar is an independent reflection of the character able to move from one mirror or reflective surface to another, observing and telepathically communicating with its master. And the, of course it has minor cosmetic differences, such as an evil goatee or some such. It is capable of inflicting a small psychic attack on any creature that looks directly at it. So essentially, you turn your reflection into in a mirror into a, a, a familiar, and it moves around independently which would be hilarious if it goes off on a mission and suddenly you don't cast reflections. People might think you're a vampire. Warlocks are quite often seekers of truth. They are obsessed with uncovering knowledge, finding answers, rediscovering history, and reducing the, their ignorance of the true nature of reality, as freaky as that truth may be. This quest for knowledge is an addiction that continues long after they find and bind with a patron and gain power that way. In fact, the patron may easily motivate the warlock just by hints and leads to new secrets ready to be learned. Just the suggestion that the, the patron has secrets that the warlock can uncover is pretty much all the motivation that a character needs to do uh, anything. If your warlock does end up with some otherworldly mutation, an obvious sign that they are not quite normal anymore, it's up to the player how they handle it in character. It's also up to the DM to portray how people of the D&D world react to this devil sign. Some things can be explained away pretty easily, such as outlandish hair colour or weird skin condition, but having tentacles for fingers is not so easy to explain away. Get used to wearing gloves. Some have asked, what is the fate of a warlock? Is the soul of a warlock doomed? Well, no, not unless that's part of what their um, pact is with their patron. Their soul will pass through the ethereal void, traversing the fugue plane, receiving judgment by Kelm of War, then pass on through the astral sea, arriving in the correct plane as a native outsider, um, a newly arrived resident who calls that particular cosmic plane their afterlife, their, their home. What the Warlock's alignment is, is more important than who their patron is, unless they sold their soul to a demon prince, of course. Um, presumption of what the presumption of the common folk though is that all warlocks have sold their souls to an evil being and it's something that these warlocks have to contend with all the time it's unavoidable so a lot of warlocks prefer to stay pretty low-key appearing as little more than a traveling hedge wizard or an acolyte uh, with more mundane animal familiars that they can do a fair approximation of being say a ranger 
there is a huge potential for great characters with this uh, class. You can cre- recreate the Alienist Prestige class, specializing in summoning creatures from other planes of existence. You could be a warlock who collects a menagerie of creatures that they um, are actually very useful. And finally, who wins a fight between a high-level warlock and Demogorgon? Demogorgon does, of course. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll be back again soon.